Subarus are awesome. Subaru has been the leader in symmetrical all-wheel drive for a long time now, which in turn makes them hilarious fun to drive off-road in the snow, in the mud, dirt, really anywhere that you want to go. And turbo Subarus make that so much more fun and exciting. That being said, there are a few things you need to look out for when buying a turbo Subaru. I'm here to create a helpful and fun guide on what to look for and how to buy any Subaru with a turbo. I advise you to stick around for the whole video to help you from getting into a huge financial mistake or headache. Shit, shit, shit. Oh, Jesus, end of the soup. Oh. Since Subaru has several different models with turbocharged engines, I'm going to chapter this video by each model and year starting from 2001 to 2015. We will only be covering non-Impreza models up to 2008 and newer generation WRXs to 2019 since this is where most of the market buyers will be looking. One thing that's going to be a constant as we go through this video is proper maintenance records. I know this can be said for any car, but Subarus are a little more special of a breed. A few things that really stick out for the boxer engines are head gasket failure, ringland failure, and rod knock. While these are all major failures, most of them come from a lack of maintenance or an abused past, or both. As we go through these cars, please keep these things in the back of your mind while you're looking for a turbo Subaru. If you were to ask me, I wouldn't even consider buying one unless you have proof of maintenance records or work that's been done or you have the money to do so yourself. So let's get started. I'm about to go down to Taco Bell and give me a Baja blast. This is a 2006 Subaru Baja Turbo and it's rather strange. Yep, Doug said it best. The Baja is a very interesting car, truck, trar, caruck, I don't know. The Baja is the successor to the Subaru Brat, which was a first of its kind back in the day, similar to the El Camino and Ranchero. Granted, those two had V8s, where the Baja has Subaru's turbocharged 2.5 liter boxer engine that they put in pretty much everything, and still do. Most people would rather spend their money on an Avalanche, or heaven forbid, a Honda Ridgeline. I think it's fairly safe to say that you can be confident buying a Baja, since they're not nearly abused as much as their sister vehicles. Have the car inspected, make sure the head gaskets and timing belt were done around 100,000 miles, and if they haven't been, plan on doing them in the lifetime that you own the car. Not a whole lot of bad can be said for the Bajas, mostly because they're not very popular, so there's not much that goes wrong with them besides the normal Subaru stuff. This bad boy can fit so many groceries in it. I have a soft spot for Foresters. If you've seen any of my previous videos, you'll know that I've owned one of these super sleeper mom wagons. These were the Trackhawk Cherokees before they were cool. If you're in the market for a Forester, you are in luck. Most owners of these cars tend to take pretty good care of them, mostly because the demographic of who owns them, that being moms, or dudes in their late 20s and 30s who want a practical Subaru that just has some power behind it. Besides leaving them stock, there are two ways most owners go about modifying them. They either lift them or lower them. If you're buying an already lifted Forester, keep an eye out for the undercarriage and check to see if there's any damage from off-roading. Checking the undercarriage can also go for lowered Foresters as well, since they could scrape the oil pan or anything else underneath there. Other than those few minor things, the only thing that can really come up for the Foresters are window seals. This is a common problem with Subarus in general, since the windows do not have a frame around them like traditional cars. I created a video showing exactly which part to purchase and how to change it out on my channel that I will link here now. <music> Surprise! Here's another car that I've personally owned. The Legacy GT is no doubt the luxurious Subaru of the 2000s. If you're really looking for a super sleeper, your search ends here. The Legacy GT also comes with Subaru's 2.5 liter turbocharged boxer engine. You're going to find this a common theme. The EJ25 is an old motor, but it was put in everything. For things to look out for, on the 05 to 07 models, make sure that the turbo up pipe was either replaced with a newer version or an aftermarket one. This was the only big problem of the first generation GTs because the up pipe had a tendency to unalive itself and proceed to feed the turbo tasty little bits of metal. 
While this generation looks great, I would personally steer towards the 08 to 09 generation. While both generations had the spec B trim, the later model got the non-DCCD version of the STI 6-speed, which is a much stronger transmission. After 2009, the Legacy GTs started to get a 3.0 liter flat 6, and then later a 3.6 flat 6 but they were not turbocharged, so we will exclude them. I will say that the flat six sounds awesome with an exhaust though. really getting into the meat and potatoes. The Impreza is by far the most popular turbo Subaru you will see out on the road. Each generation has been given a code name by the Subaru community. They've been classified by the style of their headlights since every iteration has a new facelift which came with new headlights. The 02 to 03 generation is the bug eye. The 04 to 05, blob eye. 06 to 07, hawk eye. And the 08 to 14 had the same name, stink eye but are instead distinguished by their body style. 08 to 2010 was the narrow body, and 2011 to 2014 is the wide body. Finally, we have the 2015 Plus, named the Evo Eye. We have now been blessed with the 2022 WRX, which hasn't garnered a name yet. However, I have heard it referred to as the Sharp Eye. This new generation is brand new, so no reliability information has been discovered as of the release of this video. The Bug Eye was the first Turbo Impreza that the United States got. Regardless of its quirky looks and cult following, America was just happy to finally get a fun Subaru in the States. The Bug Eye got the 2 liter Boxer, which is renowned for head gasket failure, more so than any other generation. Most of these will be higher in mileage, so steer clear if no word of head gaskets or timing belt have been addressed. Other than that, if you find one of these dudes in a wagon hatchback form, you've got yourself an adorable, all-wheel drive, burbling bundle of fun. These next two are very similar, so I'm going to reference to both of them quite a lot. The Blob Eye and Hawk Guy were the first Imprezas to receive the 2.5 liter EJ257 in the STI models. This is where you will see most of the Subaru community lie within these two generations. For good reason too. The Blob Eye and Hawk Eye are arguably the best looking Imprezas Subaru has ever released. Like the Bug Eye, you can get either a sedan or a wagon hatchback. I don't know if they're classified as wagons or hatchbacks. When I had mine, the title said Sport Wagon, but people will argue it's a hatchback. Oh well. WRXs in these years were, again, plagued with head gasket issues. And Ringland issues started to creep up as well. Another thing I will point out is from 03 to 07, the transmissions in the WRXs only were not as strong as most owners would like them to be. So keep that in mind if you start modifying a 5-speed WRX within these years. The STI was finally introduced into the American market with the release of the 05 Blob Eye. With it came the EJ257, which had stronger internals and more displacement than the WRX. And most importantly, they came with the glorious six-speed DCCD transmission. DCCD stands for Driver's Control Center Differential, which is just a fancy acronym for a small little control switch that lets you adjust the clutch packs in the center differential to send a certain amount of power to the front and rear differential. It is very common for owners to swap an STI six-speed into their WRXs and other Subarus for that matter, purely for reliability and build potential. The only difference between the Blob Eye and the Hawkeye transmissions is the Hawkeye has slightly longer gears. That's it. Both are incredibly stout. Okay, I want to drive home a very important and somewhat controversial point regarding SCIs. Okay, here's the plan! And this goes for the 08 Plus models as well. If you are planning on buying an STI, make sure you do one of these three things. Number one, buy an STI that has a new motor or recently rebuilt with receipts. I cannot stress this enough. If you do not have proof of work, do not buy the car. Your upfront costs on this will pay you handsomely down the road since this work has already been done for you. Number two, if you ignored the first option, put aside at least $5,000 for an engine rebuild because your engine will blow up. No if, ands, or buts. These cars are fun and they're driven hard. However, they're commonly owned by young kids 
who do piss all for maintenance. Please, I beg of you, either put aside money or mentally prepare yourself for this event, because you'll be ready for it when it happens, not if it happens. And finally, number three. Three! Please don't betray me, Lord! Oh, okay, okay, number three! If you are mechanically inclined, and you're like me, and you don't trust anyone, buy an STI shell and an engine separate. This way you know for yourself that both the car is in good shape and the engine is brand new. STI shells are, unfortunately, up for sale more often than you think, because of the previous options I mentioned. I've been in the Subaru world for many years now, and I've seen this happen far too much. Please save yourself time and money, and refer to any of these options when buying an STI. Okay, rant over. Moving on to the 08 to 14 generation, we have the narrow body. This body style doesn't get much love, since most of the Subaru people prefer the later year facelift. Honestly, this generation gets a lot of hate, which is a shame because it's just as much a Subaru as the others. Most of the flack comes from one major defect that absolutely has to be done if you plan on getting into a narrow body. There are spot welds that hold the clutch, brake, and accelerator pedal to the firewall. Over time and over constant use, these spot welds begin to fail, which create an audible squeaking noise, and if not taken care of in time, can break through the firewall. Can I press the clutch? Alright, again. Alright. Obviously this is really bad and can cause an accident. If you're confident enough, you can address this yourself by drilling out the spot wells, replacing them with bolts, and welding the entire housing around the firewall. If you're not confident, or don't know your half inch from your 10 mil, then I would recommend taking it to a local, reputable Subaru shop. According to Subaru, they charge about 10 hours of labor and around $100 to $150 an hour. So you're looking at around a $1,500 to $2,000 repair job. If you come across a narrow body in your search, do yourself a favor and investigate to see if the firewall has been repaired. If not, run. As for the wide body, everything was addressed regarding the issues with the narrow body. This tends to be a body style more pleasing to the eyeballs, and it also received an upgraded turbo, adding about 40 horsepower over the narrow body. This was around the time Subaru started to get a handle on the head gasket issue, but not completely. I know I'm beating a dead horse here, but ask for maintenance records regarding head gaskets and timing belt. If it's over 100,000 miles, and neither have been done, you have been handed that torch of responsibility. As sad as it is, this was the last generation WRX that Subaru offered as a hatchback. As a wagon and hatchback lover, this makes me, and lots of others, the big sad. Besides the Hawkeye hatch, this is my favorite body style of hatchback WRX. <laughs> if you're a little confused as to why this is just the WRX section, well, that's because Subaru axed the Impreza name from any correlation to the WRX as of 2015. The Impreza WRX was changed to just the WRX, and the STI was the top trim for the WRX. The Impreza and WRX do not even share the same body now. Another big change with the release of the 2015 Plus WRX was the introduction to the new FA20 Boxer engine. Actually, let me rephrase that so I don't get destroyed in the comments. The FA20 was already in the Subaru BRZ, Toyota 86, and Scion FRS. The WRX got a revised version, the FA20F, which had block changes as well as a turbocharger. The entire Subaru community was very skeptical and critical of this new release. I remember it vividly. Reddit threads and journalists alike all hated the new look. It was commonly referred to as the Subaru Camry, which is hilarious because nowadays most people love this generation. It can be argued that it doesn't retain the same character and fun as the earlier generations, but regardless, this was the new WRX whether people liked it or not. Another big win for the new WRX was the manual was only offered as a six speed instead of the five speed from previous models. And there was much rejoicing. While it doesn't keep the same characteristics as the STI transmission, it was still a six speed and still stronger than the previous five speed. On the flip side, this was the first WRX to also get the CVT transmission. Let's be honest, if you're buying a WRX, you're buying a manual. If you did opt to get the CVT, it was the earlier iteration of Subaru CVT, which came with lots of user complaints. If you've ever driven a Subaru from this time period with the CVT, you'd understand. Car enthusiasts were frustrated since the CVT never felt like it changed gears. Well, 
because it didn't. Thankfully, Subaru has come a long way in terms of CVT transmission tuning, but that's besides the point. As for reliability, most of these cars are just barely out of their warranty periods. You can find lots on the local classifieds with under 100,000 miles. There really isn't any common issues with this generation WRX. Owners haven't really complained much about problems with their cars, and if they have, most of them have been resolved within their warranty period. As usual, ask for maintenance records, use common sense, but you should be in good shape to purchase one of these. And in my personal opinion, stay away from the CVT. And finally, we have the last of the STI. Yep, you heard me. As of the recording of this video, there are no more future plans for an STI from Subaru. Rumors have been circling about a hybrid STI, but we the people have no concrete evidence. What may come as a surprise to many, the 2015 plus STI still uses the 20 year old EJ257. Will you follow me again? I'm getting too old for this shit. Which means, you guessed it, watch out for head gaskets and ringland failure. It's crazy that this is still an issue so many years later, but when buying an STI of this generation, refer to my previous disclaimer regarding STIs. The only thing I will add is try to find one with as little miles as possible to reduce any issues or problems that may arise in your ownership. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us to the end of the video. First of all, congrats for making it through my meme-filled lecture. After watching this, I know you're probably thinking, well, Subarus have a lot of problems from the sound of it. I'm just gonna get an Audi or a Golf or a Civic Si. I can't stop you, and sometimes, I don't blame you either. However, there's a certain charm that Subarus have that you can't experience without owning or driving one. Living in a climate that gets all four seasons, having a Subaru in the snow has given me a sense of security I have only been able to replicate with my truck and four-wheel drive. If you're still crazy like me and still plan on buying a turbo Subaru, tread with your common sense close and your outlook open. It will be some of the most fun and challenging driving experiences you will ever have. Thanks for watching everyone and I'll see you in the next video.